I'm here as Queen Victoria, in case you didn't know who Queen Victoria was. I just want to read you something. In Malargal, Australia, I've heard it too. Some Cornish miners found some gold. I have travelled across the sea as your ruler, long reign me, for my share, if truth be told, of this not insubstantial lump of gold. I know that I've nothing to fear from this Republican rabble over here, and I'm sure that I'm in no danger if I run off with the welcome stranger! <laughs> Gold fields. 
at some point he met up with John Deason and they shifted out here and set up this claim. Richard Oates was a single guy and after finding the welcome train you could describe him as fabulously rich. One of the first things he did was he went back to Cornwall and married his childhood sweetheart, Jane Penrose. And for quite a while he lived, apologies to all the Cornish people, in the town of Bojayan. No one's arguing with me. Um, <laughs> It's not far from St. Just where he'd been born and he and his new wife Jane lived there with Richard Oates, widowed mother. And he was there for two years. It's an interesting point that nobody really knows what actually happened to the claim here. Obviously John Deason kept working it, but he must have taken on some extra assistance for a while, and then after two and a half years, Richard Oates comes back, and their partner's again on the claim. When we went round the walk, we saw where Richard Oates' hut was. One would assume when he got back, he enlarged it, tidied it up a bit, and six months after he got back, his wife Jane and her brother arrived in Australia and shipped it up here. Now they were only in the Ligel for three years. The claim got worked out about 1875, and so Richard and Jane moved into Denali and lived there for six years and Richard continued on as a miner. He, they did a lot of good things. Like, once they found the welcome stranger, uh, decent and Oates donated money to the Denali Hospital. They loaned a hundred pounds to the Church of England so they could finish the church that they've been building for three years and still hadn't completed it. Um, he purchased a shop in Denali and rented it out. 1880, he up and they shifted to Bialaba, where Deason purchased a farm there and the dirt, oh, sorry, <laughs> that was a farm there and lived at the Oliver for about 15 years. And finally, they shifted to Woodstock, which is this side of Morong. And he lived there till 1906 when he died. During the uh, bank crash of the 1890s, um, when things were closing and it looked like Newbridge was in a bit of trouble and the hotel was going no good, Richard Oates purchased the hotel, put some money into run it and kept the hotel open for the town. Oh, he probably made a bit of money out of it side, but it's also these things that they did which were very community minded. As I mentioned, Richard Oates was born. <coughs> we seem to be losing it. Richard Oates was born in St. Just. If you look at the signboard, um, and I did the wording for the signboard 30 years ago, we've got both of them born in Tresco. Not true. Um, John Deason was born in Tresco, Richard Oates was born in St. Just. So John Deason was born about 1829 in Tresco, which is one of the, 
a town on one of the islands, one of the Silly Islands, off the coast of Cornwall. His father was a fisherman who died when John Deason was only one year old. So after that, his father moved to St Just. And one would assume that Deason and Oates, both living in the same town, that's when they got to know each other. As a 12-year-old, John Deason was listed as working as a tin dresser in the mines. He got married in 1851 and came out to Adelaide in 1853. And then a year or two later, came across the Bendigo to the goldfields. And his first wife died and a number of the kids died and he remarried Catherine. Catherine's the one you'll see in the photo. Um, and then 1862, with Oates, they shifted here to Malayagon. Nobody seems to really know how long the two of them had been in contact with each other. But being childhood friends, both shifting to Bendigo from different directions in 1854, suggests that they were together and had probably mined there for the eight years before they shifted to Malayagon. One thing that all the history books seem to leave off about John Deason, year after he finds the welcome stranger, he became a councillor for the Shire of Etbet and served a term there. He built a shop in Denali which he rented out and that one, the shop was pulled down, but the bricks were used to make the Denali Transaction Centre. So those, that's still there. He kept mining and farming effectively for the rest of his life. Invested a lot in various mining speculations. Some of it went horribly wrong and he lost a lot of money. Um, 1872, he opened a wine shop in Malaya. And so he's taking all sorts of different directions. 1883, John Deason put in the lowest tender to build a, the Malaya Reservoir. And he probably didn't do it himself, but it was a way of employing locals to help the community. The actual nugget itself, we've got the monument here. They said it was found in clay, the colour of a half burnt brick. When I read that years ago, I thought that's, that's a hit. And in Stevens Gully, over the ridge, I remember finding a little patch of that half burnt brick coloured clay and I dug up a bucket of it and soaked it and panned it and got nearly half an ounce of gold out of it. So there was something in that story. The cast that we're looking at, the model, it's not very good. There was no photograph taken of the Welcome Stranger Nugget. What originally came out of the ground was more quartz than gold. And the gold was black. It was coated in iron oxide. Uh, that stains the gold a real black colour. The reef up here, same thing and it was named the Black Reef for that reason. So what they originally found, the lump that 
was in the ground was probably, by volume, about 80% quartz. They broke off a lot of the loose bits of quartz. They took it down in the cart to Decent's hut, put it in the fire. The idea was to, to heat it up to fracture the quartz. When it cooled down, they were able to break off a lot more of the quartz. And a lot of this quartz had gold in, of course. In this process, they broke the main piece into three smaller pieces. And it's these three pieces that were taken into the bank in Denali and put on the floor of the bank, and that's what the sketches are on. Um, what went to the bank at that stage was mostly gold, but still had a lot of quartz in it. And when you look at the model, yes, it's spray painted nice gold. You'd expect that. It's not a, it's not a saleable item but if you spray it black. <laughs> and there's no allowance for all the quartz that was in it. And furthermore, it was rough. There were jagged pieces sticking out of it. The whole lump had not travelled very far. Your cast looks nice and smooth, far more presentable, um, but far less accurate. They found it on a Friday morning. On Monday, they took the quartz that they'd broken off to Edward Udy's battery in Maligal and had it crushed up and they got 60 ounces of gold. Why that, that's the reason why they didn't take it to the bank on Monday is because they were taking the quartz and getting that crushed and got the 60 ounces that day. Their original plan was to take the nugget to Melbourne and display it and charge people to have a look at it. That had been done a number of times before with other nuggets and some people made a lot of money and at the end of it they've still got the gold. Some of the nuggets were taken all the way back to England and displayed. So the 60 ounces that they got on the Monday was effectively, well it was more than what they needed but it was cash in hand. So they and their friends would travel down to Melbourne and set up a place where they could display it and sell. But Tuesday arrived and they headed off to Denali in, they used Edward Udy's spring cart and a number of their friends jumped on as security. We would assume heavily armed. Of them, we know Walter Brown was one of them and there's a few other names floating about. John McCoy, um, Thomas and John Hewitt, George Ray, Edward Lewis. No doubt they're not all on the cart, but their names are linked with it. Um, how factual or how just we like to be linked to the welcome stranger, I don't know. The only one we can positively say was Walter Brown. And one would assume Edward Udy being his spring car, that he was driving it. Decent hut was down the bottom here. And there was a track led direct down that way 
past uh, Yooks Place, there's some Chinese, we now call it Gypsy Road, and it goes down to the Maliagal Denali Road. So the Nugget never ever went to Maliagal. When they hit the Denali Maligal Road and started heading towards Denali, the first big store they came to was Matthew's Engerman Hotel. And they stopped there to put the pieces on the shop scales to get a rough weight. Because at that stage it was all guesswork. They didn't know. When they got into Denali, they first went to the Bank of Victoria and Walter Brown walked in and asked the manager what's the price of gold per hundred weight? <laughs> now probably he didn't take it so seriously. So they went across the road to the London Charter Bank and they got a better price and that's where it went. Part of the problem was Word about gold travels. You find a bit of gold and tell someone, you can tell the second person, but by the time you tell the third person, they already know. <laughs> and word had got into Denali, and there was quite a crowd, uh, potentially 2,000 people were around the streets in Denali interested in what's this massive nugget that's been found. So they deposited it in the London Chartered Bank in Denali. They got cold feet. They realised if they continued on the cart to try and make it to Castle May, there's a lot of potential spots on the way where they could get held up. And so they changed their mind. Common theory is that the nugget was taken to Wall's blacksmith shop and broken up on the anvil. Not very practical, potentially dangerous, and just not the right sort of thing to do. The manager of the London Chartered Bank, John Jess, had only been in Denali a few weeks and suddenly he's faced with a lot of gold and a lot of people in the street. There's no way he's going to let that out of his sight and out of the security of the bank. So the three pieces, the three big pieces, were put on the floor of the bank and people came in and had a look at it. Amongst these was Charles Weber and Francis Fern, who both made sketches. <coughs> we know that the gold, the biggest piece, was too big to fit on the scale. And so the story is they broke it up so it could fit on the scales. Well, yeah, that's true. But they spent five hours breaking up the gold. They didn't need to do that to get it on the scales. They got it into smaller pieces, got the rough weight. The five hours was spent in breaking it up into smaller pieces again so that it could fit in the crucibles and the London Chartered Bank had their own smelter. During the process, they broke some coal chisels and they went across to Watson's store opposite in Broadway and, and purchased some new ones. If it had been up at the blacksmith, he would have had spares. So, 
Kai sketches were made by looking at the three pieces pushed back together on the floor of the bank. This was while they were waiting for the anvil to come down in, in the wheelbarrow from Wall's blacksmith shop. Charles Weber was a watchmaker in Denali. Francis Fern was a surveyor and draftsman. They both made sketches. The sketches, more or less the same, but there's a lot of significant variations. <coughs> the crucial thing is both of them went home and both of them did their sketches from memory. So that's another bit of accuracy that is changed. William Parker was a photographer in Denali and he made a photograph of Weber's sketch. And it's Weber's sketch that was used to make the model that we're so familiar with now. Interesting, Deason and Oates said that Fern's sketch was the best. It was a fair representation. But when it comes to Weber's sketch, they said it, it would appear to represent not incorrectly the outward appearance of the welcome stranger. That's a polite way of saying it's not as good. <laughs> so they used the wrong sketch to make the model. Two years later, the mines department was setting up an exhibition to send to London, to the International Exhibition in London. And part of their display was casts of various big nuggets. And someone pointed out, the biggest nugget of all, the welcome train, you don't have a cast of it. So that's when they decided to make the model, in 1871. When they did that, Francis Fern wasn't happy. He worked for the lands office in Denali, and he thought his sketch was far more accurate. So in 1872, he wrote a letter to the borough of Denali and said, I'll make it a model for you. For seven pound, 10 shillings, I'll make it out of plaster of Paris with gold leaf. Had he done that, there would be two models of the welcome stranger and two very different looking models. If you look at the one we've got now, it's a fairly flattish piece. Both of them agreed with the length, but Francis Fern was more inclined, he said, its depth and its width was the same. So you would have had a model that was long and more rounded shape. Um, mightn't have been as good looking as the one we're familiar with, but might have been a little bit closer to the truth. People love to argue about the monument was put in the wrong spot. I think, without exception, every large nugget that's hit the media found with metal detectors, there has always been someone come along and say, oh, they didn't find it there. The same thing applies here. Importantly, when they found the nugget, they put in a post. 
So a few days later, when William Parker came out to take the reenactment photos, which we've got the three of them, we'll discuss later, that post was here. The post isn't in the photo because they didn't do the reenactment there because it was all freshly dug and would have been a mess. So they've come up the hill a little bit and taken the reenactment photos there. The other important thing to do to, with that is those photographs, they're not news photographs per se. Deason and Oates actually engaged Parker to take the photos for them. And as a result, they kept the negatives. And no doubt, that post would have been taken out because they would have mined all round the nugget right down to bedrock. Um, that's too good an opportunity. Eh? Whether they replaced the post after, we don't know. But putting posts in was a fairly common practice. Uh, the Viscountess of Canterbury nugget, that had a post on it, and the boomerang nugget, um, in fact, the boomerang nugget, you can still go in the bush at Tarnagulla and the post is still there. So when the Mines Department came along in 1897 to put in the monument, which is significant in itself because they weren't doing a lot of that sort of thing. They weren't making monuments back in the 1800s so much, not in country places like this. So when they did that, John Deason was still living in Malaya, and there was a number of people who had been involved with the nugget that were still here. And I'm quite sure that if the Mines Department had put that in the wrong spot, someone would have complained. Common story is the nugget wasn't found there, it was found further down the hill. Deason himself says that there was a root of a stringy bark tree growing through the nugget. And so stringy barks, we've got a few people leaning against the stringy bark there. Um, stringy barks grow in and above the iron bark and they'll go down the hill a little bit, but not very far. The, when Parker did his reenactment, the, the nugget was gone, so they grabbed a great big lump of quartz and used that. Afterwards, Deason took the lump of quartz down to his house, and when he shifted into the Malival, he took the lump of quartz with him. And so, 30 years later, there's another photo of Deason as an old man standing next to that same lump of quartz. Another crucial point, long before this monument went in, the Mines Department decided, look, there's lots of gold nuggets getting found and we're not keeping a record of it. And so in 18, 1868, they started a nugget register, which was good timing because the following year, the Welcome Stranger was found. In that, their notes, they specifically say that the nugget was 50 yards from the Black Reef. Here's your Black Reef here. 50 yards are going to be horribly close to where the monument is. There's lots of myths grown up about this nugget. A lot of them are not true. One that decent notes for poor miners. 
No. They had a good claim. They were doing all right. Three years earlier, they'd found a 36-ounce nugget in a gutter. And it was that gutter on the edge of their claim that they slowly worked. It wasn't payable. They stayed working on the main part of the claim and every now and then they take a bit out of that gutter. And it took them three years to work their way up with very little gold and then bang, landed on the welcome stranger. That 36 ounce that they'd found three years earlier, they'd sold that to purchase 80 acres of land. Um, and it, before that, they'd found a 180 ounce nugget. So they were doing all right. Uh, there's even one a story from the daughter that says when they found the welcome stranger nugget, they had 10 ounces of gold hidden in the roof of Deason's hut. So all these stories of them being poor and the shop not giving credit, they're just stories that are made up. Another one, the nugget was found outside of their claim. That's got to be nonsense. They found a 36 ounce nugget in a gutter. Other miners knew that, it was recorded. If that gutter went outside their claim, someone else would have pegged it. So it was clearly, it was on their claim. And finally, um, as a curiosity, at Redruth in Cornwall now, is really, that's the largest monument there is to the welcome stranger, it's in Cornwall. Now, I think I've debunked a few myths. Um, now I'm going to start a new one. Which is a curious way of how stories start. Near Tresco, where John Deason was born, there's a little uninhabited island and it's got a couple of big rocks on it balancing on top of each other. And they're known locally as Deason's Cap. And sometime over the last 150 years, the people of Cornwall have started this story that under these big rocks is a nugget of gold. <laughs> Anything for tourism. <laughs> So, I hope I've given you a different view of the Welcome Stranger. Um, there is a lot written about it that is clearly not true. And we like to look at the facts. That's about it for me. Philip in front of me is going to be responsible for reenacting the reenactment photos. So the three photos that were taken in 1869 next to the tree down here, there's going to be an attempt to group people with preference to descendants of those in the photos and try and reproduce those photographs. So. The Goldfields Historical Society would like to thank you. Um, we've managed this um, event as a free day. We hope afterwards you stop and have a picnic lunch and chat amongst yourselves. 
and go home saying you've had a good day. All right. Thank you.